Very pleased to be with you. Everyone is talking about smart cities and smart nations, and the question is how to get there. So all of that relates, of course, to big data. Now we have a lot of data available. Within just one minute, we sent 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts, and of course, while we go shopping, while we move, all of that creates digital traces and big data altogether that can be used for all sorts of good things and bad things too. Now, Chris Anderson had a dream. He said, if you just had enough data, we don't need science, we don't need theory anymore. The truth will basically reveal itself. And that created a situation where people have really collected a lot of data, as much data as they could actually get. And the question came up, can we build a crystal ball that allows us to see what's going on in any corner of the world in real time? And would we be able even to predict the future? And in fact, these kinds of projects are on the way. The military is working on it, um, companies are working on it. And the question came up, uh, could we now rule the world like a wise king in a data-driven way? So if the truth reveals itself, the idea is we just have to do it, right? Now, it turns out, however, that things are not that easy. Even a data-empowered benevolent dictator would make mistakes. And this magic formula that we've been dreaming of, that more data means more knowledge, and more knowledge means more power, and that means more success, that doesn't always work. And I will give you some examples for this. One problem is spurious correlations. Over here you can see that uh, the number of serial killers would increase with chocolate consumption. And you know, if that were true, then living in Switzerland was, uh, would be very dangerous and we would have to lock away all those people who eat a lot of chocolate you know, from the point of view of predictive policing. Fortunately, that's not true. And the reason is the more data we have, the more patterns are in there. And you know this, if you walk out at night and see in the sky, then you see a lot of patterns, but most of them don't have a scientific meaning, right? And actually, these kinds of problems are real. 23andMe offered a genetic test. You could send in some probe of your body and then basically would get back a letter that would tell you what kind of diseases you would most likely get and what would be diseases you might die of. Now this kit was actually uh, taken off by the US um, Health Authority and they don't do these kind of things very often. The question is why did they do that? Well basically if you send a probe to another company, you would get a different prediction about the diseases you would get and the diseases you would die of. So basically, big data isn't yet as reliable as we would want it to be. And in fact, if we talk about smart cities, we would expect that the leading IT nations are in this list of the most livable cities in the world. It turns out, however, that none of the big IT nations in the world is listed over here, right? So if we would know already how to turn the world into a T-driven paradise, then we would expect San Francisco to be on this list or Los Angeles, for example. So big data doesn't work as well as we hoped. The question is, would artificial intelligence fix the world? In fact, people expect that within about 20 years time, computers will overtake human capacities. Some people think it will take 40 or 100 years. Some people think maybe it's already around the corner. And in fact, since quite a few years, computers are better chess players. Robots are better workers in many places. Uh, they don't complain, they don't get tired, they don't have to pay taxes. Um, and most likely would have cars that are better drivers in the future. IBM cognitive computer diagnoses diseases better than many doctors. 
and it's also answering questions better than humans, those questions that already have an answer. So that's all very amazing, of course, and uh, we love this technology, but why then do people like Elon Musk get so nervous about artificial intelligence? He said, I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I had to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. So when he said that, he was probably not thinking of this problem over here that we've seen just recently, that uh, a chatbot created by Microsoft turned into a Nazi within just a day. So they're not more rational than people in contrast to what has been claimed in the past. Now what people are really getting nervous about is that some visionary people have suggested that we could run society like a giant machine. And if we wanted to do that, then we would have to know what all, all these different parts, how they interact, how they can be manipulated, and of course, we're part of that society too, right? And that has a lot of implications, but uh, in fact, IBM is working on this, this campaign, IBM for president was actually not meant as a joke. Um, Google is working on it. They want to reprogram the state. They are working on an operating system for our society, not just for your computer and your smartphone. But we have been asked how this operating system would work. And so we have to discuss about it. And in fact, uh, this book is trying to make a contribution to this debate. It basically says that after the automation of production and the invention of self-driving cars, the automation of society is next. But there are different possibilities to automate society. But first of all, let's talk about what's going on right now. People use machine learning techniques that are run on personal data, your personal data, big data, of all of us in order to find out what we are doing, why we are doing it, how our thinking, our emotions, our behavior can be manipulated. And that's being done with technology that's used by Google and others. Uh, personalization used, for example, for personalized ads in order to make you click certain links and buy certain goods and um, basically we are tested out every day with millions of experiments to check out how we can be uh, how it, uh, we can be made to do certain kind of things so companies are working on programming people in a sense and the question comes up are we already <coughs> remotely controlled well certainly not entirely but if you look at pictures like this we've all seen them you could really think well there is certainly a grain of truth in it already. Then the next question is, what would be the further development? Certainly people say, oh, we could use that actually to make people behave more healthy, uh, to take more care of environment. But this technology can also be used, of course, to manipulate man uh, public opinion and also democratic elections and to do bad things, in fact, to make people buy goods that are not so healthy, and that's being done most of the time. Now, it turns out that nudging, and even this big nudging that brings together nudging in big data about us, is not as efficient as one would like it to be. Um, and that's why, actually, people are thinking about next the next steps in the innovation process in order to make people do certain kind of things. And personalized pricing can come up with reward and punishment mechanisms to that people do certain things. And then there's another level, which is called the citizen score, which is currently being tested in China, where basically everything that citizens do is recorded and will get a plus and more minus points. So when you click a certain link, a news link that is actually critical about the government policy, then you get minus points. Uh, if your friends or your colleagues do that, you would get minus points too. 
Now, what is the impact of this? If you want to have a certain job, if you want to have good conditions for your loan, if you want to travel to other countries, then you need to have a certain level of points. So this is pretty totalitarian, we can certainly say, and this is not the kind of society we would want to live in. So what kind of society should we be living in? It's kind of clear that we will be living in a data-driven society, but there are many different possibilities, and that brings us to a crossroad that requires a public debate and a decision. We have come into a situation where digital technologies are creating a perfect storm. We have suddenly cloud computing, big data, self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, internet of things, um, bitcoins, all these kinds of things are suddenly there and they're coming together and they're reshaping the world. Uber is challenging the entire taxi business in the world. Airbnb is challenging the hotel business in the entire world. Bitcoin is challenging banks. And now it's possible to print buildings with a 3D printer and to, to build a 57 level hotel within three weeks time. So this is kind of shocking. It's also good in a sense, of course, but their challenges and in particular robots are now taking quite a few jobs and challenging uh, classical jobs and that challenges many of us. We may lose the job we have. In fact, there's a lot of unemployment already in many countries, especially among young people. And that could actually threaten social and political peace in those countries. But it's not only a challenge for employees, it's also a challenge for employers. According to statistics, 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone in 10 years. Some cities are bankrupt, and in fact, most industrialized countries have a level of debt that's almost not repayable. Maybe it's never repayable. So we're all in trouble, and in fact, Günther Oettinger has pointed out, we are in a digital struggle for survival. By 2020, he said, it will be decided who survives this and who doesn't. And I think he was not just talking about companies, but also about countries. So we are again in a transformation of our economy and society as we've seen it in human history. We've seen this transformation from the agricultural to the industrial society and from there to the service society. Now what we are seeing at the moment is a transformation to the digital society. Unfortunately, these transformations are never smooth. They come with financial and economic crisis. In the past, they came actually with uh, revolutions and wars too. This is what we need to avoid this time. We need to learn from history. We need to avoid mistakes. And so how to master the digital transformation of our society? Well, some people say, Democracy is an outdated technology. It has created health, wealth, and happiness for billions of people, but now it's time to do something new. <laughs> and in fact, these are the models. Feudalism 2.0, a few big IT companies would run the show, would run the world. Uh, fascism 2.0, or also communism 2.0. So different models, um, a reinvention basically of old historical models. And this is happening in various countries around the world. In fact, uh, democracy in Turkey is actually pretty much in trouble. The same applies to Poland and also to some extent to France. And I'm not sure how stable are other countries in Europe and around the world. So we need to worry about this we, because we could lose what we built over hundreds of years, what we learned from world wars and other events. We need 
to protect self-determination, freedom, human dignity, pluralism, democracy, and many more things. And we don't need to do that because we got used to it, because they're functional prerequisite for a complex society to thrive. So I would really like to say, you know, stop this. There is no benevolent dictator. And for the very reason that there is no science that can tell you what is the goal function that this benevolent dictator should actually maximize. Should it be GDP per capita or sustainability? Should it be power or peace? Should it be um, life expectancy or happiness? Nobody can tell. That's why everyone has to find out himself or herself. And that's why we have a pluralistic society. This pluralistic society allows for diversity. That diversity is actually needed for innovation, for collective intelligence, and for societal resilience, because our society will be challenged by unexpected events. And only a pluralistic society will have solutions somewhere that will be doing the job in those situations. But we will see a transformation of our society. I do think that regulation, optimization, and globalization uh, have been good for our society, but they're reaching now a limit. So we need to think about new success principles to get beyond that limit. And these are co-creation, co-evolution, and collective intelligence, and the symbiosis between man and machine. And why is this? because of these relationships over here. So processing power, the blue curve, is increasing exponentially. It doubles every 18 months. And that's, of course, great. But the data volume is increasing even faster. It doubles every 12 months, which means nothing else than within just one year, we're producing as much data as in all the years before. That means in the entire history of humankind, it's really hard to imagine it implies, however, that we could never process all these data. In fact, we can process a smaller and smaller percentage of data. And that's why we need to know what are those data that we need to look at. That requires science again. There's another thing that happens in our world. We network the world, and that creates actually a combinatorial increase in complexity. And that overtakes uh, even those exponential curves. So as a result, even though we have more data than ever, it becomes less and less uh, possible to control the world in a top-down way. And we require a new control paradigm. So this is actually coming up. It's distributed control. And that is the reason why we need more participatory systems. And that calls for digital democracy. So how to enable collective intelligence? The world is so complex that no single individual can really fully grasp it. And also no supercomputer, even if super intelligent, it's really necessary to bring the knowledge and ideas of many minds and also artificially intelligent systems together. And that requires online deliberation platforms. So we can now build those platforms where everyone could uh, put the argument on a virtual table visible for everyone in a transparent way. And then people could start sorting those arguments to figure out different perspectives on a problem. Once that process has been done by all the stakeholders and all the people that uh, have a benefit or potential um, issues with the problem, then you can have a round table where representatives of these different perspectives will sit together in order to try to come up with innovative, integrated solutions that meet different requirements, because it's really important in a complex society to come up with solutions that don't just maximize one goal, but are capable of creating opportunities for many companies and people. So it's really about empowerment, about creating opportunities. 
And uh, this is the process that leads there. Why is this a superior principle? You've seen that, for example, in the Netflix challenge, which has demonstrated the value of collective intelligence. I recommend you to have a look at the Wikipedia page over there. Wikipedia, of course, also <laughs> a nice example for collective intelligence. Um, the point is there was a competition, a big data competition for a million dollars in order to predict people's viewing behavior and um, their taste. And it didn't work out very well. So that's why the competition was made. And the best team did not manage to jump over the 10% improvement that was required within a two years time. And finally, the boss became kind of impatient and said, don't you want to do something else maybe again? And they said, okay, then we have to take a different approach. And what they did is they averaged their predictions with, uh, say, the second and the third team. You would think if they average with solutions that are worse than their own solution, it should be worse altogether. But surprisingly, it did the job. <laughs> it was better than all the solutions that were found before. Then, say, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth team did the same. They averaged over their solution. They were as good as those other teams. So that basically shows that not the best solution is the winner, but it's the combination of different perspectives that comes up with better solutions. And that's why we should really engage ourselves in discovering, using, and combining all those success principles that are underlying those many cultures around the globe. There's thousands of them. We could make them explicit and combine them entirely new ways. So to use the value of diversity. And this is basically what digital democracy is about. It realizes the value of value pluralism, of bringing together different perspectives. Now, we are working on this new digital approach that is compatible with self-determination, democracy, and free entrepreneurship. And this is based on distributed data storage and control. Now, for digital democracy, we need open data, but we need open data also for better individual decisions and for digital economy to create new jobs. You know, how should we create new jobs in a data-driven uh, society without data, if these data are just in the hands of a few companies. So open data is needed and it has an enormous value. It can unlock uh, three to five trillion dollars a year. So there's something in for everyone here. And in order to get there, we need to build a new real-time open data source, something like uh, Wikipedia for real-time data. And uh, we have started to work on a proof of concept called NervousNet. It's an open source platform. It's participatory, it's distributed, it's there for everyone, and it's empowering people to create their own data for themselves and for everyone else. In our smartphone, there are actually about 15 sensors, and these sensors can be used to make measurements. We just need to open up those sensors, and together we could create a global measurement system to measure the world around us. Just, we would like to have a system that we can trust, that doesn't spy on us, right? And that's why this should be run as a citizen web built and managed by the citizens. And it's important to have informational self-determination built in. So that's why you are in control of those sensors that you would open or not. And you can also decide whether you want to do the measurement just for yourself, say for a smart home or a smart garden application, or whether you want to share this data in an anonymized way. And in this way, we can create a participatory system, a system that can create new opportunities for everyone, because if this is set up well, then enabling users, customers, and citizens will lead to better services, better products, better businesses, better neighborhoods, smarter cities, and smarter societies. This NervousNet platform allows you for three levels of engagement 
First is data production. Everyone can do that. It's as easy as using a smartphone. Second one is data analytics. So these data are available for you and you can do something with it. You can do business with it, for example, and you can build your own apps or even contribute to the building of that NervousNet platform. And I'd like to invite you and everyone else to contribute to this because that would be the basis of this new sharing economy that we will increasingly see. So why is this so useful? Because we can do real-time measurements. We can also create awareness. We can build digital democracy. We can create the economy 4.0 and support self-organizing systems. Of course, gr greater awareness would be very useful because we would take better decisions. We can now map the resources of the world and who uses them. We can do that together. In fact, uh, we've built an initial system it's called Swarm Pulse. It's still simple, but in principle, it allows you to do measurement of noise or light or also take pictures and videos and map the world around you together, so in a crowdsourced way. And we can create now compasses for decision makers that would make things visible that we can't see, hear, or feel, such as social capital. That's very important for our economy and society, like reputation, trust, and solidarity. But so far, we can see that. It's now becoming measurable. And in fact, uh, we can now measure noise and other externalities, emissions, waste, but also positive things such as collaboration and so on. And this is really the precondition for the creation of a new circular economy. But that it requires an additional thing, which is actually a multi-dimensional incentive and reward system, something like a new financial system, a finance 4.0 system. And in fact, that could be the basis of a liberal, democratic, participatory, social, and ecological economy that we can and have to build now because we are faced in future with resource crisis. So we need to keep the resources in the loop we need to reuse them. And as we produce all the data and all the incentives that's being used for the creation of all this new economy, we can actually also create new money because people are now concerned about how would people earn money in future if all jobs go away? Would we need basic income? Well, maybe, but there's a better solution because as we create data, and share this data with others, we could also earn money in a bottom-up way. Bitcoin has shown that it's possible to build such bottom-up financial systems. And in this way, we could actually turn the digital desert that we find in Europe right now into a digital rainforest, which has abundance and diversity, and everyone has really new opportunities. So. That comes down to creating an information, innovation, production, and service ecosystem where interoperability, interoperability allows combinatorial innovation. And uh, there's another fascinating thing which is really important to make this work well, which is to enable the invisible hand to work well. And that can now be done with the Internet of Things by creating feedback loops that can be done also on multiple levels. And the point is really uh, to coordinate the system in a bottom-up way, like with digital assistance. A root guidance system is just one example, but we could have that also to guide us to live in a more healthy way and so on, or to get rid of traffic jams which we can do by changing the ways cars drive and interact with each other. We can also actually largely improve uh, the traffic flow in cities. If uh, traffic flows would control the traffic lights rather than the other way around, then that would save a lot of travel time and would be good for our environment too. All of that is based on decentralized control approaches and they're also becoming important in electricity grids, so-called smart grids, and um, decentralized approaches are also more and more interesting for industry 4.0. So this is on the way, but it'll take a little bit more time, and with this I'm concluding. So we can build a better system, a better future, 
sure, we should use big data, but we should open it up. It should be more participatory. It should be fair. We should use artificial intelligence, but in such a way that's symbiotic and ethical, that requires value pluralism, values by design. We should use incentive systems, but they need to be multidimensional. Okay, why don't we build a new operating system for society, but it needs to have this bottom-up opportunities, this um, possibility for self-organization, self-regulation. And I think it would be very beneficial for our society and for Europe in particular to build this new socio-ecological capitalism that's now possible by combining the Internet of Things with blockchain technology in complexity, science to overcome future resource crisis and um, solve the CO2 uh, global warming problems. So what I'd like to conclude with is saying, yes, we should build, we should use smart technology, but it needs to be combined with smart citizens. That is basically what creates smarter cities. Thank you very much.